Good afternoon and welcome to expanding home ownership opportunities by combating appraisal bias hosted by the National Credit Union Administration. My name is Ashley Gordon. I'm the financial literacy and outreach program officer with the NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection. I will be your moderator for today's broadcast. June is National Home Ownership Month, a time when we recognize the importance of owning a home and its power to help families build and pass down generational wealth. In recent years, the Biden administration has taken action to remove barriers to home ownership, and one key area has been on appraisal bias. Appraisal bias refers to discrimination in the home appraisal process and may often lead to home ownership, homeowners being assigned a lower value for their home based on race and other characteristics such as sex. Such bias, which is well researched and documented, limits the ability of homeowners to enjoy the financial returns associated with home ownership, thereby contributing to the racial wealth gap. Today's webinar aims to raise awareness about the federal government's efforts to combat appraisal bias and to expand opportunities towards home ownership. It will also highlight relevant resources for consumers and credit union professionals. Please, before we begin, please allow me to share a few administrative notes. Next slide. First, all attendees will be in listen only mode. Second, if your volume sounds too low, check to make sure your volume is turned all the way up on your computer. If that doesn't work, you may have to plug in your external speakers. Third, closed captions will be available within the WebEx console. To enable captions, click CC, closed captions, in the bottom left of your console. Next slide. And I'll also uh, just share a quick disclaimer with you. The views and opinions expressed are those of the presenters and do not reflect the official views of, nor should be considered an endorsement by, the Board of Directors, Management, or Staff of the National Credit Union Administration. Next slide. Now, please allow me to introduce today's speakers. First, we have James Wiley, the Associate Director for, for, for Fair Lending and federal, um, with the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Shamika Sutton, Special Assistant to the Executive Direct Director at the National Credit Union Administration. David Berenbaum, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing Counseling with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Affairs. And James Park, Executive Director for the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council Appraisal Subcommittee. Welcome to all of you. Now, I'd like to welcome Associate Director for the Office of Examination and Insurance here at the National Credit Union Administration to provide opening remarks, Victoria Narwald. Victoria, welcome. Thank you, Ashley. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you. I appreciate your interest in today's webinar, like Ashley said, which focuses on raising awareness about the federal government's efforts to combat appraisal bias and expand opportunities for home ownership. I'd like to thank the NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection for planning and coordinating today's session. I would also like to thank our participants from the NCUA, the Appraisal Subcommittee, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for sharing their agency's role in promoting home ownership and combating appraisal bias. Home ownership remains a central part of the American dream and the primary contributor to generational wealth building and housing stability for millions of Americans. Yet throughout our history, barriers to becoming a homeowner have made the pathway less achievable. These inequities have limited access for Black, Indigenous, and other persons of color to the wealth building opportunities that owning a home provides. A key contributor to the wealth gap is appraisal bias. To address this challenge, the Biden administration created the one-of-its-kind interagency task force 
on property appraisal and valuation equity, also referred to as PAVE, to identify and remediate bias in the home appraisal process. Since March 2022, critical progress to date includes empowering consumers with new tools to address appraisal bias, leveraging data to identify trends and crack down on appraisal bias offenders, and supporting a well-trained and more representative appraiser profession. This month, the Biden administration announced policy actions to deliver on the PAVE Action Plan and ensure that every American who chooses to buy a home has equal opportunities to build generational wealth through home ownership. We've taken actions to enhance awareness of the appraisal bias issue. Earlier this year, the appraisal subcommittee held the first ever public hearing dedicated to the topic of appraisal bias. The hearing brought together federal agencies and industry experts to define the problem and discuss potential solutions. A second hearing was held recently in May to further this objective. We have leveraged federal data to increase transparency. The Federal Housing Finance Agency published its aggregate statistics data file and dashboards. These were the first publicly available data sets of aggregate statistics on appraisal records. Finally, in addition to the many actions achieved through the PAVE Task Force, we are especially proud of how much better understood the issue has become in just two years. During today's webinar, you will learn more about these federal government efforts to combat appraisal bias and expand opportunities for home ownership. You will also learn about relevant resources for consumers and credit union professionals. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will now turn the webinar over to Ashley. Thank you so much, Vicki. We appreciate your time. And I actually just want to make one quick correction because I realized that I, I made a mistake earlier. David Berenbaum is the Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary for Housing Counseling with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that uh, before we begin. Uh, next, we are going to introduce uh, my colleague, Shamika Sutton, who will discuss recent rulemakings, industry guidance, and agency resources tailored to preventing and eliminating bias in home evaluations. Shamika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ashley. And again, welcome everyone to an enlightening and informative discussion on the expansion of home ownership and appraisal bias. I am Shamika Sutton, Special Advisor to the Executive Director and Agency Representative for the Paid Task Force at the National Credit Union Administration. Today, I will give a high-level overview of key provisions in the interagency ABM proposed rules, as well as discuss key elements within the interagency proposed or OB guidance. The proposed rule and interagency guidance are deliverables of the property appraisal and valuation equity task force dedicated to ending bias in home valuations. The NCUA and other task force agencies work jointly to draft guidance and propose actions that will guarantee a safe and sound financial system and protect consumers. Next slide, please. While there was existing supervisory guidance on the use of ABM, the NCUA was not a party to the model risk management guidance. The NCUA monitors the model risk efforts of federally insured credit unions through its supervisory approach by confirming that the governance and control for an ABM are based on three factors to include the size and complexity of the transaction, the risk the transaction poses to the credit union, and the capabilities and resources of the credit union. Next slide, please. The NCUA, however, is a party to the new ABM proposed rule 
which is designed to ensure the credibility and integrity of models used in real estate valuations. Specifically, the proposed rule would implement quality control standards for ADM used by mortgage originators in valuing real estate collateral securing mortgage loans. Quality control standards for the ADM models include a high level of confidence in the estimates produced by ADM, protect against the manipulation of data, seek to avoid conflict of interest, require random sample testing and review, as well as account for any other such actions the agencies find appropriate. A significant compliance highlight of the proposed rule requires mortgage originators or secondary market issuers to adopt and maintain policies, practices, procedures, and control systems to ensure that ADMs adhere to specified quality control standards. For this proposed rule, the comment period opened on June 1st, 2023, and will remain open for 60 days thereafter. Next slide, please. I will now transition to discuss the interagency or OB guidance. A reconsideration of value is a request to the appraiser to reconsider the analysis and conclusion of a real estate valuation based on information not presented on the appraisal report. The ROB comes into play when an appraiser's opinion of value is not agreed upon by the parties involved in the transaction. The proposed guidance describes how financial institutions and credit unions may create or enhance existing ROB processes while remaining consistent with safety and soundness standards preserving appraiser independence, and remaining responsive to consumers. Next slide, please. Here, you can see many highlights of the proposed guidance to include the differences of overevaluation versus undervaluation, an official definition for reconsideration of value, and actions a credit union can take to resolve valuation deficiencies. It is important to note the proposed guidance requires that appraisals are subject to review for compliance with USPAP standards and the basis of any estimated value must not rely on any prohibited basis under the ECOA or Fair Housing Act. The comment period for the proposed guidance began on June 8, 2023 and will remain open for 60 days thereafter. In addition, the proposed guidance gives examples of actions to resolve valuation deficiencies. Such deficiencies can occur due to obvious mistakes like incorrect square footage, missing features, or the selection of comparable properties. The latter is stated as the leading indicator for victims of appraisal bias. Potential sellers and buyers assert their appraisals include or exclude comparable properties which impact the value of their home. However, when the value is refuted, these same sellers and buyers are not aware of options to reach a solution. As such, we will now explore examples of actions a credit union can take to assist members with reconsideration of value. Next slide, please. A credit union can offer any of the following to assist members with errors or problems with their valuation, including engaging a new, independent, and licensed appraiser to review the original valuation, ensuring there are policies and procedures to foster an ROB process, which includes information not originally considered, and last but not least, establishing a complaint resolution process to inform consumers how to raise concerns with their valuation report. Next slide, please. I will now transition to discuss engagement with stakeholders and available agency resources related to appraisal bias and reconsideration of value. This federal initiative included cross-agency collaboration and NCUA engagement with the stakeholders, including state supervisory authorities, credit union members, credit unions, and their associations. Next slide, please. The NCUA made a considerable effort to ensure the path of combating appraisal bias was equitable inclusive and diverse as we engage many stakeholders to receive feedback. In meeting with the Connecticut Department of Banking, the commissioner himself 
expressed concern with the curing process due to his personal experience of bias with his home appraisal. The department offered input and insight from the state perspective to propel the initiative forward. The NCUA also met with multiple property valuation firms to learn more about the details of the ADM technology and how data is used in models to alleviate any risk of bias. Some key features of advanced models include an automated selection of comparable properties. This is to remove any human discretion in the selection of, of comps. Zip code forecast, which is a projection on future value and purchase activity within a given area. And condition informed valuation with the use of artificial intelligence. Other engagement included state trade associations and active participation in the PAVE Task Force. As a member of the PAVE Task Force, our principal and representatives of the agency participated in multiple hearings, testimony, and webinars to educate and highlight our commitment to this effort. Next slide, please. Finally, here you can see the many NCUA resources for this initiative, which include a website where we listed frequently asked questions related to home appraisals and the paid task force. We also have a web page and infographic on how to challenge an appraisal. We've also included links to multiple NCOA webinars about home ownership, the wealth gap, and bias in home valuations. And last but not least, we have an op-ed by our chairman, the Honorable Todd Walker, describing the causes and effects of appraisal bias on the wealth gap. This concludes my presentation. I will now turn it over to Jim Park of the Appraisal Subcommittee. Thank you, Shamika, <clears throat> and thank you to the uh, NCUA for inviting me to be here and talk about this uh, very important issue. Um, I will just give a quick further disclaimer that uh, these are, are my own personal comments and remarks and uh, may not represent the views of the appraisal subcommittee or its member agencies. Uh, next slide, please. So the appraisal regulatory system is completely unique. So I just want to take a couple minutes here to uh, give a quick overview of how the appraisal regulatory system uh, works and, and what it consists of in the United States. Uh, it's made up of three uh, main players, the states, the private sector, and the federal government. So the private sector, which is probably the most unique aspect of the regulatory system, um, consists of the Appraisal Foundation and its two boards, the Appraisal Standards Board and Appraiser Qualifications Board. They have congressional authority to establish the minimum uh, qualifications that appraisers have to meet in order to get a license or certification. So how much education, how much experience, um, and what the examination uh, consists of. Uh, the Appraisal Standards Board uh, writes the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, otherwise known as USPAP. Both the qualifications and the standards are issued to the states. Uh, the states, by federal law, are required to employ those standards in licensing uh, uh, real estate appraisers in their state. Uh, the states, so the states are the ones that are actually interacting with the appraisers. They're the ones that are determining whether they have the minimum qualifications uh, to become an appraiser. And they also determine whether the, whether the appraiser uh, is following the uniform standards. So they also have disciplinary action authority uh, uh, in case the states, uh, in, in case the uh, appraisers are not following the standards. Uh, the states can exceed the standards. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that on a later slide, but they cannot go beneath the, uh, the requirements set by the appraisal foundation's boards. Uh, the appraisal subcommittee is a federal government agency uh, that has two main roles. Uh, one is oversight and the other is support. Uh, for the over for the for the states as well as the appraisal foundation, so we have um, uh, oversight of the states, what I would call more of a classic oversight authority, where uh, we uh, audit the states, uh, do a compliance review of the states at least uh, once every two years to determine their level of of adherence to uh, to the federal requirements. 
Uh, we have monitoring and review authority over the Appraisal Foundation, and we also provide grants to the states and to the Appraisal Foundation. Next slide, please. So the appraisal subcommittee is made up of seven federal government agencies uh, represented here on this slide. Uh, the uh, agency highlighted in green, uh, the CFPB is currently the uh, chair of the appraisal subcommittee. So all three banking agencies are, are on the uh, subcommittee board, uh, the National Credit Union Administration, um, as well as HUD and the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Next slide, please. So when the issues uh, regarding appraisal bias came to light um, several years ago, uh, the appraisal subcommittee uh, took it very seriously, uh, became, uh, was, was very concerned about the, um, the lack of diversity in, in the appraisal profession and the numerous reports uh, in the media of black homeowners uh, receiving appraisals that they felt were low and then after uh, what has been uh, called whitewashing their homes, meaning uh, they would uh, remove any indication uh, that a black family lived in, in the home. Uh, another appraisal report would be would be obtained. And in several of these cases, uh, that second appraisal report uh, came out significantly higher than the original report. So a little over two years ago, the appraisal subcommittee commissioned a study of both the standards and the qualification criteria to ensure that neither systematize or enshrine um, any type of uh, discrimination or, or bias, and, and further that they promote diversity and equity in, in the appraisal process. Uh, the National Fair Housing Alliance, along with Dane Law and the Christensen Law Firm, uh, did the study, and uh, there were several outcomes that I'll talk about uh, in, in, uh, in just a minute. Uh, the PAVE Task Force has already been mentioned. The Appraisal Subcommittee was a prominent member uh, of the task force. Uh, the subcommittee, uh, the agency was on the task force as well as all seven of our member agencies. And the subcommittee is also, uh, as Vicki mentioned, has been hosting hearings. We've had two hearings so far to uh, um, uh, call witnesses before the subcommittee uh, to uh, give presentations. Uh, as well as answer questions. Uh, we have two more hearings uh, slated. Uh, the third hearing is scheduled for later this year, and then a fourth hearing will be held uh, in the first quarter of 2024. Next slide, please. So between the PAVE task force, uh, the study that was commissioned by the uh, subcommittee uh, there are some common themes that, that are emerging, um, and, and those are governance of the appraisal industry. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, structure of our regulatory system is totally unique. There's really nothing like it uh, in the United States or abroad. Uh, the Appraisal Foundation in particular has little uh, oversight, uh, and, and that was a common theme uh, that emerged from both the uh, uh, PAVE task force as well as the, the study that the subcommittee um, commissioned. Uh, fair housing requirements and training are lacking. Uh, up until recently, um, the uh, uh, appraisers were not required to take uh, education required regarding uh, appraisal bias or fair housing. Uh, the appraiser qualifications board is in the process of uh, exposing uh, potential um, additions to the education requirements that are already in place that will require uh, appraisers to take uh, uh, continuing education regarding uh, fair housing and valuation bias, uh, as well as qualifying education uh, on, on that uh, theme as well. Uh, barriers to entry to the profession is another common theme. Uh, it, it's very difficult to become an appraiser, largely because you have to find a, you have to obtain experience. That's one of the appraiser qualification board requirements is that you have experience before you can sit for the examination. 
And in order to get that experience, you have to find a supervisor. <clears throat> so finding a supervisor can be extremely difficult. It can take uh, individuals years to find a supervisor. Uh, and, and that has uh, more than likely led to a, a lack of um, uh, diversity in the profession, or at least been a major contributor to that. And then compliance and enforcement. Uh, there are uh, some real <laughs> enforcement um, uh, issues uh, in, in terms of how um, uh, both at, at the federal level uh, and there are some enforcement and inconsistent um, uh, in, uh, ways that uh, the standards and qualifications are enforced at the state level as well. Next slide, please. This slide may be a little hard to see, but I just wanted to get, give you an idea of uh, the uh, a dashboard that was created uh, for the PAVE task force. Uh, this was created by the ASC staff, and, and basically it shows um, each state in the country. If you go to pave.hug.gov, uh, you can see uh, each state in the country by rolling your cursor over the, the, the map of the United States, the states will pop up and it'll show uh, if that state has criteria uh, that exceed the minimum qualification criteria promulgated by the Appraiser Qualifications Board. Uh, the reality is uh, almost all states have some type of qualification criteria, um, what, uh, uh, what otherwise could be called uh, uh, barriers to entry. Uh, to get into the profession. Uh, we will be updating uh, this, um, uh, this dashboard as states make changes. Uh, and uh, one thing that we've discovered is a lot of the states don't even realize that their statutes and, uh, and or regulations exceed the minimum qualifications. Next slide, please. I also want to highlight um, a, a real success we've had in terms of our grant program. Um, uh, and, and going back to this theme of the difficulty in finding a supervisor and getting your experience. Uh, the appraisal subcommittee provided uh, about two and a half years ago now, uh, the subcommittee provided a grant to the state of Mississippi. Uh, they had a uh, serious shortage of appraisers, particularly in their rural markets. Uh, so Mississippi requested a grant in order to provide the training uh, that's necessary to become to get the experience and become a licensed or certified appraiser. So it, it really defeated um, one of the biggest barriers to entry, which is finding that that supervisor. Uh, in about a nine month period of time, they were able to uh, the state of Mississippi was able to use those grant funds, uh, train 13 uh, diverse individuals. Um, who uh, are now, uh, I, I believe all of them have passed the exam uh, and are now practicing appraisers. So I, th I think it's a real, a real win for, uh, for all concerned. Next slide, please. So this final slide is just my contact information. Uh, and I mean this sincerely, uh, jot this down, uh, take a picture. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, my virtual door is is always open, so do not hesitate to, to reach out, and I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that I can. Uh, thank you again to the NCUA for having me, and now I'll turn it over to James Wiley, the Associate Director of Fair Lending at FHFA. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm James Wiley. I'm the Head of Fair Lending at the Federal Housing Finance Agency. First, just let me say thank you to the NCUA for hosting this event and inviting me to speak. And let me also note that my comments today reflect my own views and not necessarily those of the FHFA. Next slide, please. So before I get into the details of my presentation, I wanna talk a little bit about what FHFA is. So we're the regulator for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the federal home loan banks. Now, these are secondary mortgage market institutions. And so importantly, we don't regulate the primary mortgage market. The secondary mortgage market is the pathway in which mortgages are packaged and sold as securities to investors, which provides liquidity to the primary market 
and allows lenders like credit unions to keep making mortgages. Nevertheless, the standards and practices of our regulated institutions in the secondary market, like their standards for appraisals, impact fair lending in the primary market, which is why my office exists, the Office of Fair Lending Oversight. You can find out more about FHFA and the Office of Fair Lending Oversight on our webpage by clicking on the link on this slide. And for all the slides in my presentation, most of the pictures are also links that you can click to follow right to the document that I'm talking about. Next slide. As part of our role as regulator for Fannie and Freddie, we have access to a tremendous amount of appraisal data. We began looking at appraisal data when news reports started to surface of the experience that black homeowners had with appraisals and allegations of bias that emerged. In late 2021, we published our first blog on the topic of appraisal bias. In the blog, we highlighted direct references to race and other protected classes under fair lending laws that we had identified in the free form text field of, of appraisals. You can see some of those examples here on the right. For example, in one, in one appraisal, a town was described as having a quote, black race population above state average. Uh, other appraisals, for example, gave specifically the racial makeup of the city where the subject property was located. And one appraisal referred to an area with many immigrants as one spicy neighborhood. Now these um, references are obviously completely inappropriate and unlawful. And these instances represent what we call direct evidence in fair lending. We published some of these examples in this blog post as a way to start providing public transparency and moving the conversation forward on this issue. Appraisals are not supposed to take race or other prohibited factors into account. In fact, in big bold letters right above the free form text area where many of these were found, it says on the appraisal form issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that race and racial characteristics of the neighborhood are not appraisal factors. And yet we found these examples. Now, while the number of these references is small compared to the overall pool of appraisals, the fact that they existed at all in the present day and age was troubling to us and indicated a compliance breakdown. This is because for them to cross our desks at FHFA, they had to have gone through several steps. The appraiser themselves had to write the comment and so either did not understand that this was unlawful or was deliberately doing this. The appraisal management company had to have missed this in reviewing the appraisal. An appraisal management company is a company that acts as a middleman in the process between the lender and the appraiser. The lender had to have missed it in reviewing the appraisal and ultimately the loan uh, connected with that appraisal uh, would have been purchased in the secondary market using that appraisal. So our first priority when issuing this blog was to highlight some of these examples and message to the industry the compliance management around direct references to race and other protected classes needed additional review and training and referral and investigation where appropriate. Next slide. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac both released research on the topic of appraisal bias as well. They took different approaches, but both sets of research showed differences in how people in neighborhoods of color are treated in the appraisal process. Freddie Mac's research focused on the fact that appraisers tend to value properties below the contract price of the property more often in black and Latino neighborhoods, even when controlling for other explanatory factors, including neighborhood income. Now we know that not every property should be appraised at the contract price, and that is one of the protections that independent appraisers offer is identifying when a property does not support the transaction price so the consumer does not overpay for it. Yet we clearly see in the data that even controlling for numerous factors, there is still a patterns where homes and neighborhoods of color are valued less more often. The Fannie Mae research used an AVM or automated valuation model as a benchmark instead of the contract price. It identified that white borrowers in neighborhoods were more often favored uh, and overvalued by appraisers compared to the AVM. And there were also distinctions between how white and black borrowers tended to be treated within black neighborhoods. We encourage you to check out the research for yourself, and we hope that the research along with the data that I'm about to discuss help researchers and the public continue to explore this topic. Next slide. 
One of the primary ways that we at FHFA are working to combat appraisal bias is through the release of public data. You might be familiar with the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which is a set of data about the mortgage market that is released annually that shines a light on practices on that market and allows all stakeholders to see issues and correct them. We have begun releasing public appraisal data for the first time, and we hope that this release helps, uh, helps do the same thing for appraisals that Humda data has done for the mortgage market more generally. We've released data going back to 2013, and we update this data currently quarterly. We're planning our next update for the end of this month. We also sometimes release new statistics and data fields with the updates as we continue to work providing work toward providing more public transparency in the appraisal market and on appraisals. We think that this data is useful to many stakeholders. Lenders and appraisal management companies can use them to understand the market and benchmark their compliance testing. Appraisers can use them to assess their own practices and how they may differ from peers. Researchers can use them to help identify root causes and continue to explore appraisal issues. And consumers themselves can look at what appraisal, what the appraisal market looks like in their area. We think that the uses of this data go beyond appraisal bias as well, as appraisals are an important element of our financial system that deserves strong data accessible to all that can be used to, to assess the market. Next slide, please. We wanted our data to be usable by consumers and groups who may not have access to powerful statistical software. That's why much of the data is also captured in easy to use dashboards that are available on our website that allow you to create graphs, maps, and charts with the click of a button. We released a blog in 2022 alongside the release of the data showing how you can assess the data and use the dashboards to investigate the issue of appraisal bias or undervaluation uh, in your particular area. We're continuing to build out these dashboards and data, and we encourage feedback through the email box, which is available on our website, on additional data that stakeholders would like to see as we continue to assess what we can appropriately release to the public while making appropriate considerations to make sure that no one's privacy is compromised. At FHFA, we're here to support our interagency partners in speaking with one voice and working together to address the issue of appraisal bias. We want to provide a transparent and fair appraisal market that works for everyone. And we're going to continue taking action and working with all stakeholders to address the issues that we see. Appraisers, lender, and lenders should be knowledgeable about a bit. Appraisers and lenders should be knowledgeable about appraisal bias and know how to prevent it with compliance and training. When they do receive a complaint from a consumer, they should know how to handle it properly. And when a consumer needs to file a complaint with the state or federal agency, those agencies should be knowledgeable on how to handle it and have access to, to the information they need to address it. All of these stakeholders, including the consumer, should have access to public transparent information into how the appraisal market is operating. Thank you, and I'll now pass it over to David Berenbaum. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the NCUA for inviting HUD's Office of Housing Counseling to speak with everyone today. In particular, I am going to be focusing on the work that our office is doing with the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at HUD to engage consumers and housing counselors to identify and challenge appraisal discrimination when it's taking place and to ensure that every American can live in the community of their choice free from discrimination. Let's move on to the next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with HUD's Housing Counseling Program, there are over 1,500 HUD-approved counseling agencies across the country. They are all private, not-for-profit 501c3s, and they employ, they employ over 4,000 HUD-certified housing counselors. That is a new certification requirement that was mandated from the Dodd-Frank financial reform law. Each year, the program touches over a million consumers. And as well, our office is responsible for ensuring best practices and compliance among all of the programs across the nation. One of our priorities is to ensure that grant funding of our agencies goes to qualified, 
high impact organizations with a focus on reaching low to moderate income communities and diverse markets across the country. And we also provide training and technical assistance. Next slide, please. There are many different forms of housing discrimination. There are many different forms of housing counseling. And among them, all of the clients who receive HUD approved housing counseling receive information about their fair housing rights. It's not surprising that, of course, over the past few years, a very large percentage of our sessions each year have been to help consumers move beyond the pandemic, whether it was to avoid foreclosure or to avoid eviction. We've been doing a lot of very strong work collaborating with Treasury, in particular with the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the Homeowners Assistance Fund programs. But significantly, over half of our sessions nationwide are for pre-purchase housing counseling. People are really still interested in realizing homeownership as well as sustaining their homes once they're in the marketplace as a whole. Now, we also provide other forms of counseling whether it's rehousing the homeless, ensuring that consumers can receive information after a disaster, or overcoming some of the scams or predatory practices in the marketplace. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we do have a very strong focus on housing equity. Of course, Secretary Fudge is committed through the PAVE initiative to ensuring that every American can live in the community of their choice, as I noted, free from discrimination. We are currently partnering with over 40 HBCUs and minority serving institutions across the country to educate the next generation of homeowners to impact the benefits of homeownership and to making smart and informed choices that lead to, in fact, the next generation of homeowners. We're also working in other partnerships to educate counselors and to educate students at the universities to becoming licensed appraisers, to becoming mortgage professionals, and to entering the housing finance marketplace. It's a very exciting initiative, and in fact, I see it growing over the next few years. Under our Comprehensive Housing Counseling Program, we have a new initiative called the Home Ownership Initiative that will also foster next generation, first generation homeowners. And we're going to be working with HUD approved housing counseling agencies to ensure that we provide culturally sensitive as well as linguistically appropriate services. And then in our training programs, which are quite extensive for the housing counseling community, as well as other social service providers, we are in fact supporting partnerships where we're educating housing counselors and the entire safety network, the whole uh, safety net out there of providers to be knowledgeable about appraisal discrimination, what is responsible appraisal, and how to know your rights. We've worked very closely with the PAVE Task Force, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about what we are doing next. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so during National Home Ownership Month, the Office of Housing Counseling has launched a very exciting national awareness campaign. It's called Let's Make Home the Goal. And it's going to be a national campaign, which is launched in 15 cities initially, but over the next several years, we'll be continuing and touching every community in the nation. We're partnering with both public and private sector leaders. And what we're going to be doing is giving a source of information, a trusted source of information on certified housing counselors, frankly, expanding the reach of these folks to touch consumers nationwide. We have a brand new agency search engine, which has robust information about housing counseling on it. And that's available both via toll free number, where in fact, there are interpreters have been available in close to 300 languages, as well as a modernized internet search tool, where there's robust information about the role of housing counselors. And in this campaign, we're gonna be using consumer brochures and posters, flyers, as well as lots of other collateral in multiple languages to educate consumers not only to their own ownership opportunity and rights, but also to the appraisal issue. The Let's Make Home the Goal campaign has launched marvelously on Reddit and in social media, and we look forward to expanding it with your support. Next slide, please. 
Our overarching goal is to increase our reach from serving 1.2 million to 3 million or more consumers over the coming years. But more importantly, that we're creating a well-informed, responsible group of homeowners who are ready to, in fact, enjoy the benefits of living in the housing of their choice. This is particularly important, both at time of purchase as well as time of sale, because homeownership remains the most significant method of creating intergenerational wealth, as well as having low to moderate income consumers join the middle class. Next slide, please. So, PAVE and our priorities. First, I'm very excited to share with you that we are working with both the public and private sector leaders in the housing counseling community, who over a decade ago created the industry best practices for home ownership education, what's called the NSHAC. <clears throat> and we're going to be working with NeighborWorks America and facilitating discussions with industry leaders to update those standards to include responsible appraisal and also to ensure that housing counselors and other providers nationwide have the ability to really educate consumers to their the resources and the choices that are available to them so they can responsibly approach home ownership. And if unfortunately they encounter appraisal discrimination to overcome it. <clears throat> As well, we're working with the Office of Fair Housing and Opportunity to do collaborative consumer education. It's already begun. We're doing uh, meetings across the country with the housing counseling community. We're doing webinars. And we're also asking all of our training grant program uh, leaders to do training in their own communities. As I noted earlier, under the HUD Housing Counseling Program, fair housing is a covered or mandated area that we cover. And so we're really taking quite a bit of time to ensure that our consumers have the information they need and as well resources made available to them that should they encounter some form of discrimination, they can speak with a Fair Housing Initiatives Program Agency, their state or local human rights commission, or file a grievance with HUD FHEO or some of the local appraisal boards across the country. The basic rule of thumb will be an expectation of fair and responsible appraisal and zero tolerance when discrimination is encountered. Now, we're also going to be incorporating appraisal knowledge and information, the whole appraisal discrimination issue, into the counselor certification exam. Quite candidly, it's a very challenging exam already, but we do recognize it's important to keep it fresh and updated. And every year we are updating the exam to, re to reflect new methodologies, new approaches, new best practices, including the recent PAVE announcements that are underway. And so this will be a component of future odd certification for counselors moving forward. Now, besides the appraisal training and the continuing education that we do to HUD certified counselors, we're also focused on related social service providers, legal service providers, and other not-for-profits. Because of course, many people approaching housing counselors are presenting many risk factors. It could be a nutritional issue. It could be a health issue. It could be a sexual harassment or related issue and so on. And so we want to be sure that all of our providers in our network and all of the groups that they work with are very well briefed on this issue so that they also can support consumers and work with lenders as well as real estate professionals to identify and overcome the issue whenever they can. And last, our office participates in and sponsors a host of industry conferences, and webinars, and training. We do that for example, like we're today with the today agency, our, our brother and sister organizations with the NCOA today, but also we do it with the CFPB and a host of other trade associations throughout the year, because we want to make sure that all of our stakeholders have the information they need, again, to address this issue. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll wrap and say thank you. The Office of Housing Counseling is here to be a resource to you, both as a gateway to all of my colleagues at HUD, but also if you're interested in working with HUD certified housing counseling organizations in your own community. Many of our agencies are already actively working with NCUA members, and I applaud that, but there's a lot more that we can be doing to bridge the home ownership gap together. 
Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to Ashley Gordon now. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to all of our speakers for their insightful presentations. Uh, next slide. Oh, we were on it. Sorry. Thank you. Um, as we close out uh, today's webinar, I'd like to just highlight a few of the resources that we offer on mycreditunion.gov, which is NCUA's uh, consumer facing website. Uh, these are resources that you can share with credit union members uh, and staff, as well as just the general consumer audience um, related to property appraisals and bias in the home valuation process, so PAVE. Uh, check out our recent video, um, which you can share on your social media and on your websites, as well as an infographic that we've developed on how to challenge inaccurate home appraisals. As well, we encourage everyone to sign up for our financial literacy and outreach newsletter um, when you get to our website as well. Again, um, thank you so much for your time. Today's webinar is going to be available on NCUA's YouTube channel within the next couple of weeks. And we're also going to make sure to send out a readout to all of our attendees of today's discussion uh, via email so that you have the resources and links that were discussed. I know uh, James Wiley mentioned some links in his presentation and we'll make sure that you all um, have access to those. Thank you very much. We're gonna go to our final slide and say thank you again to our speakers and thank you to all attendees and we hope that you have a great day. Take care.